Well, good evening to everyone. Good to see you here tonight. I'm glad that we can be together. Hope that you've had a good afternoon, and uh, we're glad that we have this opportunity to worship once more. Glad that my family's able to be with us tonight. They woke up this morning, and a couple of the kids were sick, and so they stayed home. Us men came, but uh, they are all doing much better, and I'm glad that they can can be here. We have all seven of our grandkids with us tonight, and so if you want to know the people that I, I, I talk about, that I use as my illustrations, there they are, uh, and uh, they're full of them, and uh, they're wonderful, and we are enjoying having them with us. Uh, they're going to go home, I guess, tomorrow, and uh, we hope that all who are traveling uh, will be safe, but uh, I'm glad that they can be with us this evening. I got a little worried while Mark was making those announcements. He mentioned the lectureship at Fort Hill this weekend, and uh, I just got this, this much offended because he said, we can go and hear some good preaching. <laughs> and I, I, I guess I, maybe I shouldn't be offended. I don't know. Maybe he didn't mean anything by that. But uh, we, we do hope that we can go and be a part of that good lectureship. But uh, we hope that, but that you appreciate the good preaching that we get all the time. I will know that you'll get some good preaching next week because I'll be gone and one of the fellows that's in the lectureship will be here filling in for me. So we can look forward to that. Jesus was the master teacher. No one ever spoke like him. People, even his enemies, were spellbound. He taught them so differently, not like one of the scribes. He, he taught with authority. And one of the things that Jesus used in his teaching was a parable. If I ask the question, what's your favorite parable that Jesus gave, I imagine we'd get a lot of different answers. I think probably the one that most people would say is their favorite is the parable of the prodigal son and that's because we can all identify with the prodigal son we've all been in the far country and we've had to return home but Jesus would use those things that were just common things that were very familiar and he would teach a spiritual lesson with those things now I certainly am not trying to claim to be in the category of Jesus as a teacher, but I want to share a parable with you tonight. It's not a parable that you'll find in the Bible, but I'm calling this parable the parable of the hand. And what we're going to do is allow each finger, each digit on the hand to remind us of a very important idea. And that way, if you get this, you will always be ready to teach. You'll have a lesson on hand, okay? And so if you can remember these things, it'll go a long way in helping you be prepared. Remember this morning, we talked about being prepared to share the message, being prepared to teach. Well, if you can remember these five things I'm going to share with you, you'll be ready to teach and to share. Now, we're going to start with the pinky, all right? The little finger. All right? It's our weakest finger. And we're going to allow it to remind us of our weakness. Our weakness. I know it's the weakest. Every now and then Tammy will come home and she's got groceries in the car and, and I'm the one who gets called out to bring them in. And I grab as many as I can and once in a while a bag will get hooked on my pinky. And it, it, it's a race. I don't know if I'm going to make it into the kitchen or not, you know, before it falls off. Because that, not the bat, not my finger, the, the little bag. But, um, you know, it, it's just not very strong. And so this little finger is going to be us. We're weak. And I'm talking about spiritually and being able to save ourselves. We can't do that. That's our weakness. When you look in the book of Romans, chapter 1, the Apostle Paul explains, Gentiles, you are sinners. You need a Savior. Chapter 2, you Jews, you're doing the same thing. You need a Savior. Chapter 3, we all need 
a savior. We can't save ourselves. You go over to Romans chapter 3, and you look at verses 10 on through about verse 12, and you find the apostle writing these words for our consideration. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doth good, no, not one. And then you go to verse 23 of that same chapter. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Folks, that's us. We're not able to save ourselves. And this little finger reminds us of our weakness. Remember in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, we're reminded there that before Christ made us alive, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead in that we were separated from God. And no matter how good of a person we might be, we could never reconcile that relationship on our own. We need a Savior. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, we're reminded, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's folks who realize they are spiritually poor. We need a Savior. So this little finger, it reminds us of our weakness. We can't save ourselves. All right, the next finger is the ring finger, okay? The ring finger, and that ring finger, we're going to allow it to remind us about the idea of commitment, okay? You might be able to tell I got a ring on my finger, a wedding ring. Put it on 35 years ago, and it's been there ever since. Uh, not all the time. I've taken it off a few times. I took it to the jeweler once. Had to get it resized. And the lady said, oh, put on some weight, have you? Well, no, I stubbed my finger playing basketball. That's why I had to, if you have to know. But anyway, that ring and that finger, it, it reminds us of, of commitment. Now, I want you to think about that idea in two ways. And the most obvious, of course, is in the commitment with marriage. Marriage is a, a lifetime commitment, isn't it? You go over to, to Genesis chapter 2, and you look there in verses 23 and, and 24, and you find Adam speaking these words after Eve is presented unto him. Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. The Bible teaches us that idea of oneness between a, a husband and a wife. And the idea that it is a lifetime commitment. That's God's plan for marriage. And so that finger certainly reminds us of that commitment with that ring. But even more, let's remember that when we obey the gospel, we're going to continue to be committed to the Lord. Faithful unto Him. It is the faithful servant who is going to be given the reward of heaven. Too many people think, when I am baptized, I've done what I need to do. That's it. No, that's the beginning. That's the start of our life in Christ. From there, we're to grow and we're to continue in faithful service unto our Lord. And so we can think about that idea of commitment when we consider th this finger. Over in Luke chapter 9, Jesus encounters three people. Starting at about verse 57, there's one who says to him, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And evidently, he doesn't follow him. There's another man that Jesus calls him. He says, follow me. And the man says, let me go to my home and bury my father first. Then I will follow you. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. 
You, you follow me. Emphasizing the importance of following the commitment that needs to be there, the priority in following Christ. And then there is another who says, I will follow you, but let me go back home and tell the people there goodbye. And Jesus is going to say, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. He's teaching us that we have to continue in faithfulness. It's that idea of, of commitment unto our Lord. I hope someday, a long, long, long time from now, that at my funeral, someone is able to read the words that Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 6 through 8 about me. Paul knew that his life was coming to an end. And so he penned these words, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul had honored that commitment unto God. And so he knew that the prize was waiting for him. So what was the pinky? Our weakness. This ring finger... Commitment. Commitment in marriage, but even more so, commitment unto Christ. Now, got our middle finger, and I know the world has taken that and given it a terrible connotation. God made it, and it's a wonderful finger, all right? That middle finger is the biggest, it's the largest, it's the longest. I, I preached this lesson one time, and a fellow said, That's not the case with me, I'm a woodworker. <laughs> All his fingers were the same level. But, but for most of us, that middle finger is the longest. It's the biggest. It's the strongest. We're going to allow it to stand for the power of our Lord. You see, what we could not do in our weakness, the Lord, with his great might, is able to do. When he came to this earth, or when he was coming to this earth, it was said about him, that his name would be called Jesus. Matthew 1 and verse 21. It would be called Jesus, for he would save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus came to do. In fact, the name Jesus means Savior. And that's what he came to be for you and for me. Every step that Jesus took was a step closer to the cross where he knew he was going to lay down his life for us, for you and for me. To do for us what we could never do. To provide for us redemption. We'd been sold into slavery to sin. He came to buy us back and the price was his blood. That blood that is able to give us the forgiveness of our sins. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, as Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, he gives his disciples the bread that represents his body. Then he gives to them the fruit of the vine, and it represents his blood. And he says to them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Hadn't been shed yet, but he knew exactly why he was going to the cross to do for you and me what we could never do. Over in Hebrews chapter 2, and in verses 14 and 15, we read these words about what our Lord has done for us. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's what he did for you and for me. He is our deliverer. And so what we could never do, he did 
by his great power and his great might. So we have our weakness, the idea of commitment, and then the power of our Lord. Here's our next finger, called the pointer finger, the index finger. And it's going to point the way. It's going to point where we want to go, to that heavenly home. I, I love singing with the little children up here, the songs that they sing, and, and those little ones that when they are learning about God, when they're learning about Jesus, one of the first things that they learn is where God lives. And even before they can talk sometimes, you can ask those little ones who have been in Bible classes, who parents have, have taught them, where does God live and what will they do? They just point right up to heaven. They point. Well, that's where our treasure is. That's where our minds are. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul is going to write and, and say this to his fellow Christians. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. You see, that's where our heart is. That's where our affection is. That's the goal of our lives. And we want to point people in that direction. In Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 through 21, Jesus is going to tell us, Lay not up for yourself treasure upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so we want to think about where our treasure is, where our affections are. That's the goal. But then also you think about this idea of pointing. How about us pointing the way for others? Remember when John came and he is preparing the way of the Lord. He explained, I am not the Christ. I have come as his forerunner to prepare the way. His preaching was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he was waiting for Jesus to be revealed. John is the one who baptizes Jesus. He is there when the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. And he hears the voice of God speak and say, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The next day, John's disciples are gathered around him and he sees Jesus. John 1, verse 29. And the Bible doesn't tell us that he does this, but in my mind I can see him doing it. Extending his hand, maybe pointing with his finger and saying, Behold, the Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world. You see, John understood, I'm here to point the way to Jesus. He understood that's where salvation is. That's who we need to follow. Later, they would tell John, you know, Jesus' disciples are baptizing more people than you. He would say, he must increase, I must decrease. But he was busy pointing the way to Jesus. Folks, that's what you and I need to be doing, right? We want to point the way to Jesus because you can't have salvation in any other. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Him. And so this finger, it points to heaven as we think about where our treasure is, where our affections are, but it's also the idea of pointing the way, pointing unto Jesus to lead men and women to Him. That just leaves one more digit. I don't know if you call it a finger or not. I do. I got five fingers. All right. But your thumb. We're going to let it stand for the idea of design. God's design. It's incredible what the human hand is able to do because of this thumb. And if you don't believe me, you go home tonight and you try and brush your teeth without using your thumb. You try and get in your house, use your key without your thumb. 
You try to tie your shoes without using your thumb. Because of this, because it opposes these others, we're able to do so many amazing things. And it's all because that's the way God designed it. God is the great designer. And we see design all around us. Folks, it's one of the greatest arguments that can be presented to our world for the existence of God. Wherever you have design, what do you have to have? A designer, okay? And so, who is the great designer? Well, it, it, it's our God. And so that thumb reminds us of God's design. But folks, we're not going to let it stand for the idea of the design in the universe. We're going to think of it in terms of the design of His plan of salvation. God's eternal plan to be able to bring us to Him. If you turn over to Ephesians chapter 3, and you look at verses 10 and 11, you're going to see the apostle there write by inspiration these ideas about the work of Christ, the work of the church. He says, To the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal purpose, eternal design to bring about our salvation. Do you realize that before Adam and Eve were in the garden, before they ate the forbidden fruit, before they were even made, God had a plan so that we could be forgiven of our sins. It had been determined the Word, the Logos, would come. The Son of God. And He would lay down His life for you and for me. God designed that before sin had even entered into the world. And all of it unfolded just the way God wanted it to. Look in Galatians chapter 4. In verses 4 and 5, where this great truth is related unto us. Galatians chapter 4, and verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time was come... Folks, that means at just the right time, according to God's plan, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Jesus came at just the right time to do what He came to do to save us from our sins, all according to God's plan. Look with me at one last verse over in Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, verse 46 and 47, and this is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here he speaks to his apostles, and he says to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus says, This is all unfolded according to God's plan, according to God's design to bring about our salvation. And so now you have a lesson on hand. You've got our weakness. We can't save ourselves. We need a Savior. You've got the idea of commitment, commitment in marriage, but commitment unto our God. We're going to be ever faithful to Him. This Biggest finger reminds us of the power of our Lord. What we could never do, He has done for us so that we can have salvation. This index finger is going to point the way. Point to heaven and point to Christ. And this thumb, well, that's God's design. And He is the one who designed the plan of salvation. 
I don't know what kind of thoughts enter into your minds as you go through your days or when you have time to think. But every now and then, some strange ideas, well, I wonder about. And sometimes when I think about my hand, I wonder, God, why do we have five fingers? Couldn't someone use an extra one every now and then? You know, maybe when you're just counting. I, I don't know. But why, why five? I, I don't have an answer for you. But I know this, and I think it's interesting, that in God's plan of salvation, there are five steps. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That's a good enough reason for me. And tonight, if you're here and you've not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we hope you'll take that step. As a penitent believer, you can confess Him before men. You'll be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You can go on your way rejoicing. And if you're here tonight as one who's obeyed the gospel, but you've fallen away and, and you need to come back, we want to pray with you and for you. The lesson's yours. If you need to respond to the invitation of Christ, come now as together we stand and sing.